all white people are racist. I need to understand this because I have white people who support my work. They're going to watch this and say, wait a minute, Dr. Umar, I don't hate black people. I've never hurt a black people. I don't belong to the Ku Klux Klan. I don't belong to any group who has as its focus the destabilization, destabilization and destruction of the black of black people or the black community. So that may be true. That may very well be true. But that does not disqualify you from being a racist. See, being a bigot is not the same as being a racist. When you are a bigot, you are emotionally connected to the belief that Africans need to be exterminated. When you are a bigot, you are emotionally connected to the belief that Africans are inferior. When you are a bigot, you are emotionally connected to the need to destabilize, hurt, and harm black people conscientiously in your daily life. You have to call the N-word. You have to make racial jokes and slurs when you are a bigot. I didn't say every white person was a bigot. I don't believe every white person is a bigot. I do know that every white person is a racist. So what is the difference, Dr. Umar? Rule number one, all white people are racist. What is the difference between the white bigot and the white racist? The difference is simply that the bigot hates you for being black. The racist simply wants to secure complete and total domination of resources, opportunities, and privileges for their own in-group. That's it. Racism is the business of monopolizing things that matter in the hands of white people. So a racist can like black people. A racist can listen to rap. A racist can sleep with you, marry you, have children with you, hang out with you. A racist can be your best friend. If you so believe that a racist can come around you, eat your chicken, your watermelon, whatever you want to do. This is why black people get so confused by the behavior of Europeans. This is why black people get so confused by the behavior of Europeans because you think you have to hate me to be a racist. Get that out of your mind. No one has to hate you to be a racist. How many of you have had white people who cared about you to some extent still practice racism against you and now you're totally confused? You're totally confused. You say, wait a minute. This person has helped me. I know they care. They've went out on a limb for me before, but yet and still, they kept me from getting that job. Yet and still, they stopped me from buying that house next door to them. We're friends. Why would you do that? Here's where we're messing up. When we deal with racism, there's three fundamental mistakes that African people make around the world in dealing with racism. Number one, we confuse racism with bigotry. It confuses us. It confuses us. Bigotry is not racism. It is an extension of it, but it's not the same. You can be a racist and not be a bigot. You can't be a bigot without being a racist. So that's number one. Number two, we fail to recognize that white people and every other race have an internal obligation to their own people that supersedes any petty personal relationship they have with blacks. This is a big reason why we don't get it. I want to say this again. White people, like every other race, Arabs, East Indians, Asians, Mexicans, Native Americans, every race except the African has a serious stringent obligation to protect the interests of their own race. We're the only group who don't have that, especially in the United States. In the United States, Negroes are loyal to their professional associations, fraternal associations, and religious associations. They have no loyalty to race. Hence why we are in the condition that we are in. Hence, why we are in the condition that we are in. Europeans have an obligation to Europeans. Their friendship with you for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years is irrelevant. It's irrelevant. See, for every other race except the African, their encounter 
with a outgroup member is a military engagement. Chinese are not going to tell Anglo-Saxons what they're up to. And the Anglo-Saxons are not going to help the Chinese and the Chinese are not going to help the Anglo-Saxons if in helping them, it risks the agenda of their race. When the Mexican encounters the Arab, they can do so respectfully, but the Arab is not going to tell the Mexican anything that would allow the Mexican community to get a foot up on the Arab community, vice versa. And I don't have a problem with that. That's the way it's supposed to be. Look out for your own. Black people don't have that. Your self-hatred, the Europeanization of African consciousness has destroyed your ability to put racial obligation above any other obligation. We do not have racial obligation. So when we see other people with racial obligation, we get confused. We're so naive and politically immature. We're so naive and politically immature. We're so naive and politically immature that you feel that your white friend should have put your friendship above the best interests of his race. That's ridiculous. And the reason you feel that is because in your life, you would put a white person's interest above the interests of the entire black community. You would do that with your ridiculous self. And because you have no loyalty to race, you expect them not to have any loyalty to race. They are not you. You are not them. Nobody in this country went through the ma'afa, the dehumanizing campaign known as American slavery. Nobody went through that in America but Africans. That's why we're the only people who cannot think in terms of what is best for the race. Your religion is more important to you than your race. Nobody else. The Arab is a Muslim, but his Islam does not come before his race. If it did, you would see African Muslims who are able to challenge Arabs for their success in commerce and business. You can't find it because no Arab is helping a black person outdo an Arab, whether he be Muslim or not. I don't care how many prayers y'all made together. No white Christian is helping a black Christian outdo a white Christian. Race is first, even in religion, for everyone but us. So when your white friend does something that clearly works against your best interests and in the interests of their community, that's what they're supposed to do. It's like playing on a football team. You have a friend on the other team. Your friend plays for the other team. But guess what? He has an obligation to his team. He's not going to give you the playbook. He would be a fool. Y'all knew each other since kindergarten. You guys are playing for the national championship. Why would he give you his playbook? Why is he going to help you beat his team? He has an obligation to his team. The problem with Africans is we don't claim a team. We are free agents who are unwanted by any of the other teams. Let me say this again. Africans in America, politically speaking, are free agents who don't want to belong to the team they're on and is stupid enough to think that another team wants them. That's our problem. Let me say it again. Let me say it again. Africans in America are on a team that they feel ain't worth a damn, that they feel can't win anything, that doesn't get any respect, totally disorganized, ain't won a game in hundreds of years. Rather than try to make the team better, they've given up all hope. They want off the team. They are trying to find another team. They're out there marketing themselves to the Chinese team. They're marketing themselves to the Anglo-Saxon team, the Jewish team, the Mexican team, the, uh, the Asian team, the East Indian team, the Arab team. They want another team. They want to play fullback for the Jews. They want to be the running back for the Arabs. They want to be the left tackle for the Koreans. They want to be the right guard for the Anglo-Saxons. They don't want to be on Team Africa no more. You want off Team Africa. But there's one problem. None of the other teams want you or need you. That's black America's predicament in the 21st century. None of the other teams want you or need you. None of them. None of the other teams want you or need you. 
And rather than go back to your team and try to make a winner out of your team, you rather remain a free agent until you get drafted, which is never going to happen. And since there's no team, since the team Africa don't have enough players on it, nobody wants to play for team Africa because they've been losers for 400 years in America. Nobody wants to be on team Africa because they've been losing. They have losing seasons, 403 consecutive losing seasons. Nobody wants to be on it. So you know what that means? Since none of the Africans want to play for Team Africa in America, Team Africa forfeits every single game it plays. So when you look at the preseason rankings, Team Africa is at the bottom. Not because they can't win. They don't even choose to compete. Team Africa is at the bottom, not because we can't win, but we don't even choose to compete. Team Africa is at the bottom, not because we can't win, but because we don't even choose to compete. All white people are racist. They must be. Racism cannot work unless all white people are racist. Racism is a group system of domination and monopolization of resources, privileges, and opportunities that are selfishly guarded by one group and used to disadvantage all members of another group. White people cannot opt out. You know why? If white people opted out, if all these white liberals opted out of the maintenance and perpetuation of the system of racism, racism would have fell apart by now. Racism would have fell apart by now. If you think white folks are opting out of racism, let me ask you one question. If you think white folks are opting out of racism, let me ask you a question. When slavery ended in 1865, black people owned one half of 1% of all the wealth in America. When slavery ended in December of 1865 with the passage of the 13th Amendment, black people owned one half of 1% of all the wealth in America. We are 157 years later. We are 157 years later. We still only own one half of 1% of all the wealth in this country. If the pot of whites who believe in equality with blacks has grown, if the pot of whites who believe in equality with blacks have grown in these 157 years, if that is the case, the pot of whites who have grown in their belief in equality with blacks. It has expanded. We have more white people now than ever before who claim to believe in equality for blacks. If that is more than lip service, why do Africans still only own one half of 1% of all the wealth in this country? It is impossible. I'm trying to get you to see in order for racism to survive, all white people must participate. There are no opt-outs. In order for a team to win a football game, a basketball game, a baseball game, a hockey game, a volleyball game, everybody got to participate. You can't have a weak link. If it's a five-on-five -five basketball game and one person chooses not to shoot or play defense, you're going to lose. Football is what, 11 guys, 13 guys on each side? If one of them guys on either side of that team, if the wide receiver says, I'm not running no routes, if the defensive end says, I'm not going after the quarterback, guess what? The weak link will get targeted, and through the weak link, the team will lose. There are no weak links in the white race. The white liberal is just as racist as the white conservative, the white Democrat is just as racist as the white Republican. That's right. Racism is a group system. All whites participate. It's the only way they can guarantee domination of resources, opportunities, and rewards. So for my white fans who follow my work, I'm not saying you're a bigot. I'm saying you are a racist. It's still not a good thing to be a racist. It's still not a good thing to be a racist. Okay, but your racism is about the business of white domination. It's not necessarily about the business of black genocide.
Not necessarily. But genocide is without question an extension of racism. But I would argue that genocide, to some degree, would more appropriately fall under bigotry. But I still think genocide is the prerogative of every white races as well to an extent because of the Africans ability to repopulate every other race out of existence. So genocide has to be a concern. It has to be a concern. So I'm going to move on from this topic of all white people are racist. I'm going to have to revisit this over and over again because of the political indoctrination of black religion and white media. I'm going to have to review this over and over again because of the political indoctrination of white media and black religion. They have done a thorough job on the collective consciousness of black folks to the point that we don't understand racism at all. And we don't understand collective group interests because we have none. Negroes in America do not understand collective group interests because we have none. We would rather fight then forge a way forward for ourselves. We would rather fight one another than form a way forward for ourselves. And this is one of the reasons why the snow bunny crisis, this is one of the reasons why the snow bunny crisis is such a problem for us as African people because that white wife of the black man is still a racist. In fact, at a certain level, you can see the snow bunny crisis as a covert strategy on behalf of white racism, where they send the white woman in as a double agent, an undercover operative, to steal and besiege and reclaim all of the wealth and income that the black man has and take it back to the white community. I'm going to say this again. At a military level, the snow bunny crisis is an attempt by the white power structure sending in white women to psychologically disarm these ridiculously politically uneducated black males in an attempt to steal, besiege, reclaim their wealth, assets, and income and take it back to the white community. Have you ever played Capture the Flag? Have you ever played Capture the Flag? When I was in high school, I belonged to a Boy Scout troop, Scotland School for Veterans Children. And we would go play Capture the Flag on the camping trips. And Capture the Flag was you had to go into the other people's territory, get their flag, and bring it back to your side. That's what the white woman is doing with the black man. She's playing not Capture the Flag. She's playing Capture the Bag. Not capture the flag. She's playing capture the bag. Instead of going to get the flag and bring it back to the black community, she's coming back with the bag. Retirement, insurance, wealth, assets, investments, income streams. That's what she's doing. She's psychologically disarming the black man with sex and emotion. And she's taking all his assets back to the black community. Tiger Woods, Kobe Bryant, rest in peace. The list goes on and on and on. Marvelous Marvin Hagler, the list, rest in peace. The list goes on and on and on. All these white women taking from the most financially elite black men in the country and taking it right back there to their community. The snow bunny crisis is nothing more than a political version of capture the flag. And instead of capturing the flag, these white women are sneaking into the black community and capturing the bag a financially elite black man. Let me go to 11 rules of white supremacy number two. Rule number two. And these are in no particular order. Rule number two. White people don't share power with black folks. White people do not share power. And any white person watching this, you know I'm telling you the truth. And it's not just white people. No race shares power with another race. So I don't want to single out Caucasians unjustifiably here, but we're going to speak about them because our predicament is profoundly related to the European situation. White people don't share power with blacks. So whenever somebody tells you, whenever the government says we're building a new neighborhood, we're going to transform North Philadelphia, we're going to transform Southeast D.C., we're going to transform 
Detroit. We're going to transform Milwaukee. We're going to transform Oakland and Houston. We're going to transform Atlanta and Raleigh. We're going to transform Charleston, South Carolina. They're not transforming that so you can share. White people don't share. How are you going to have racism with power sharing? They can't coexist. Racism and power sharing cannot coexist, brothers and sisters. Power sharing predicates that there is equality between the groups who are sharing. Everything's lopsided in America. Ownership of banking, ownership of business, ownership of wealth, ownership of land, control of the schools, control of the economy, control of the prisons. Everything is imbalanced because racism needs to be imbalanced in order to stay in control of the what? Resources, opportunities, and privileges. Ain't no power sharing. Well, we're going to work together. The black community and the white community are going to work together. That is a lie. That is a lie. The U.S. government is going to work with the black community to bring about equality. That is a lie. White people don't share power with blacks. Nobody shares power with another race, and especially not with people who they think they're better than. Get out of this. We can all get along. Let me clarify. We can get along. But only if black people are willing to accept a second class citizenship, which you already have. In fact, you're not even a second class citizen. You're a third class. The immigrants are second. The brown and yellow people are second. Black people, you are a third class citizen, which is 21st century slave, if I would use the words of one of the greatest Pan-Africanists of all time, El Hajj Malikel Shabazz Malcolm X. There is no sharing of power. Cut it out. Can't we work together? Go ahead, fool. Go work with them. Show me one thing we've ever collaborated on with the government or the white power structure or the white community that actually ended up being equal when it came to power sharing. There is no power sharing. White supremacy is a religion. Equality is a sin in their religion. Equality is a sin under the religion of white supremacy. And, but you've been so duped by your religion. Them Bible stories and Quran stories that messed your damn mind up to the point that you think what is preached in them books is practice in the world. No, it's not. This is why in many countries there's a separation of church and state because they don't need religious leadership blinding the political leadership to the realities that they face. There was an African pastor some time ago who climbed into a lion's den with lions and started preaching in the lion's den. And he ended up being attacked and murdered by the lions. Because, you know, Jonah went into the lion's den. Somebody went into the lion's den. David, Daniel, somebody went into the lion's den in the Bible. And so he thought he could do the same thing. The Bible is a powerful book of spiritual metaphor. It is not a literal historical text, neither is the Quran. Wake up and smell your coffee. Nothing's wrong with either book, nothing's wrong with your religion. But when you let your religious beliefs blind you to your political realities, then your religion becomes the enemy of African progress. No race shares power with another race. They are in competition. The Chinese ain't trying to share with the Anglo-Saxons. They want to dominate the planet. East Indians ain't trying to share with the Chinese. They want to dominate the planet. Nobody wants to share but us. Rule number three. White supremacy is ruthless. Ruthless, brothers and sisters. It is ruthless. We will poison your water. We will create disease. We will stillborn your babies. We will harm your elders. We will kill, cut, maim, poison your soil, use food as a weapon. There is no moral code in this universe that dictates the behavioral parameters of racists. Let me say this again. There is no moral code. I'm not saying that individual white people don't have a personal code they live by. I'm not saying that. 
But when it comes to the system of racism, meaning the body politic of white America or the Caucasian race, nothing comes in their way of achieving their goal. To take the words of one of their greatest political theorists, Machiavelli, to take the words of one of their greatest political theorists, Machiavelli, to take the words of their greatest political theorists, Machiavelli, the ends always justify the means. The ends always justify. Africa does not get taken without Machiavellian principles. America doesn't get taken. The Caribbean doesn't get taken. South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, they don't take this planet without using every possible scheme, scam, manipulative technique, and outright military, what's the word I'm looking for? Brutality. No stone has ever been left unturned by white supremacy to dominate the resources of this planet and kill the original man and woman of this planet, which is the African man and woman of this planet. When I say I'm African, I'm also telling you I am the original man of this planet. Ruthless. And another big problem we have as African people, we still don't understand how ruthless white racism is. We don't get it. We don't get it. 